Well, good morning. Hey, I want to just echo something that Tahira spoke right here, that she recognized her need for the church community, but then even that was represented in, in baptism, right? So, so right now, I, we want to encourage you. Maybe you've, you've recently started coming. Maybe you've, you've connected with Jesus. Maybe your story is kind of like Tahira's, and it's time to get baptized. Right? We've been baptizing so many people this year. If you look at the walls, you see all the signatures on the walls. Those are all the people that have been baptized within the last year. Uh, and it's something that's just really special and really exciting. So if you want to, to become baptized, if something from, to hear a story maybe spoke to you, man, talk to any of the pastors, talk to anybody wearing a lanyard. We want to celebrate with you and what Jesus is doing in your life. Well, if you don't know who I am, my name is Nick. I am one of our associate pastors here. Our lead pastor, Dave, is, is on some Sabbatical right now, and uh, we'll be returning in, in several weeks with uh, fully restored and, and ready to go. So we're praying for him as, as he's doing that. But I get to share with you today, and I want to start by just sharing a little story uh, of something happened when I was when I was younger. Um, you may not realize this just to look at me, but I used to be athletic. I used, to, I used to like playing sports. Um, they hurt a lot now, so I don't play them as much as I used to, but I, I used to especially like to play basketball. And, and I don't remember, we were at somebody's house, there was a get together, my wife and I were there, and they had a basketball uh, goal in their driveway. So me and a, a bunch of people that were there, we just started playing basketball and we were having a good time. And I don't know how long we were playing, but I went up for a rebound and, and when I landed, I kind of landed on my leg funny and it sent a jolt up through my lower back. And I instantly fell down on the ground and was just sort of writhing in pain as my back was spasming and it, and it hurt and I was laying there. But, but of course, I didn't want to stop playing basketball, right? So I just was kind of stretching it out and my wife came over and, and um, very lovingly uh, encouraged me to stop playing basketball. Uh, she, she told me, you know, she warned me, basically, if you keep playing, this is going to get way worse. And, and so uh, I did what most... Uh, young men do. I listened to my wife and stretched and put heat. That's false. I didn't do any of that. I, I stretched it out and I just kept playing. You know what I mean? Because I wanted to play basketball. And it's interesting because it's a silly analogy for what we're about to read in, in scripture. But, but in that moment, I had made some decisions that had consequences. And in those consequences, as I was experiencing those consequences, as I had that pain in my body, I had a, a, a verbal warning from my wife who was telling me you should stop because this is gonna get way worse. And I had a physical warning in the pain that I had to stop. And in my ignorance, chose a different path. So in the, in the book of 1 Kings, there's this really interesting story that, that probably doesn't get talked about near enough. It's a fascinating story that we're gonna to explore together today. In 1 Kings chapter 13, this is what it says. It says, by the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel as Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. By the word of the Lord, he cried out against the altar, 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 this is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you, he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who make offerings here and human bones will be burned on you. That same day, the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and the ashes on it will be poured out. When King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, seize him. But the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Also, the altar was split apart and its ashes poured out according to the sign given by the man of God by the word of the Lord. So, so there's a little bit of context. There's, there's some things going on here. So, so first of all, who is, who is Jeroboam? So basically what has happened is King Solomon, who's the son of, of King David, he's, he inherited the, the kingdom of Israel. And Jeroboam was one of his high officials. And sort of towards the end of Solomon's reign, toward the, towards the end of his, of his life, Jeroboam rose up in rebellion against King Solomon with the intent of taking over the kingdom. So there was this battle and they went back and forth. And, and as it kind of played out is, is Jeroboam took over the northern part of the country, which was Israel. And King Solomon was sort of relegated to the southern part of the country, which then became known as Judah. And so what Jeroboam did is he began to sort of change the political structure 
which, by the way, was based on their religion, right? It was based on the temple. It was based on their law. It was based on, uh, on, on Judaism. That's what it was based on. It was based on the Old Testament Law. And, so, and so what Jeroboam did is he began to change their political systems. He began to change how they worship. And he sort of set up all of these, these high places and all these temples. And he set up sort of a system of self-worship to kind of legitimize who he was as the king of Israel. He wanted to change things so that it benefited him politically. It's a lot like uh, Henry VIII. If you ever learned about Henry VIII, who wanted to get an annulment from his wife for political purposes, but the Catholic Church wouldn't allow it. So what does he do but create his own version of church so that he can do what he wants to do politically? It's the same kind of thing Jeroboam is doing right here. Now, King Solomon died soon after, and it was, it was smart for Jeroboam to do it because King Solomon's son Rehoboam, his aspirations were to dethrone Jeroboam and reunite the kingdom. And so Jeroboam, now having changed things politically, has set himself up to be successful, right? It's very self-serving. And this is exactly when the, when the prophet comes from Judah, the southern kingdom, he travels to the northern kingdom to proclaim and to prophesy to Jeroboam of what's going to happen if he keeps living the way that he does. And so he comes and he begins talking about the altar that's been desecrated. He's, he's talking about the altar that's been, that's been used in, in ways that is, not, uh, that is not worthy of God's kingdom. And he begins sort of prophesying against this altar and, and verbally explaining what's going to happen if Jeroboam continues on the course that he's going on. He talks about the destruction of, of what he's built. He talks about the end of Jeroboam's reign altogether. And, and he gives him the sign and the altar breaks apart. And then, and then Jeroboam yells, sees him. And then his arm withers up. And there's like this weird sort of thing that happens in this scene. But as you read this scene, there's a couple of things about sin that I think we can glean from this story with, with Jeroboam. So the first thing is sin is self-worship, right? So we get that what Jeroboam's doing, obviously, the sin he's creating is he's worshiping himself, but, but all sin, all sin that we deal with is self-worship. So just like Jeroboam sets up his own worship cult, every time we sin, we take worship away from God and we apply it to ourselves because we recognize that worship is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of obedience, and when we live in obedience, it's an act of worship. So when we live in disobedience, it's still an act of worship, but it's an act of worship of what we want to do versus what God wants for us, which is, make, which is what makes sin so tempting. Because part of what makes sin sin is, is we like it, right? It feels good. We think it's better for us. And, and sin has this way of attaching itself to us by tricking us into walking away from what God wants in our life and walking in what we want instead. And so in committing sin, we're, we're serving ourselves. And the next one, I don't think this is a novel concept, right? But sin has consequences. Over and over and over again in scripture, it says, the Lord handed them over to their sinful desires. Or we have some sayings for this. You asked for it. You ever said that to somebody who, I told you, I told you so. You shouldn't have done that. You asked for this, right? Or this is what my mom used to always tell me when I was doing something I knew I wasn't supposed to be doing. She would say, you're cruising for a bruising, <laughs> which seems like a violent thing to say to your son, but, <laughs> right? Or you say, you, you lay in the bed, you make for yourself. Right, these are all kind of ways of saying what, what that means. When scripture says, and the Lord gave them over to their sinful desires, that's, that's what it means, is that, is that somebody who's, who's living a life of sin or participating or engaging in, in, in sinful practices, that there are consequences to that. And, and, if, and if you don't disengage from that, you're going to experience those consequences. And they happen. In this case, in our story, Jeroboam's hand shrivels up as he intends to seize the prophet. We don't really know what Jeroboam would have done to the prophet if, if he was seized, but the prophet's response to being seized is the withering of Jeroboam's hand. That's a direct result of Jeroboam's decision that his hand withers up. 
And so we have to realize that when it comes to sin, that there's impact on you. There's impact on me. When I sin, there's impact on me, but there's also impact on the people around me. And that's the consequence of sin in our life. When we allow it to, to reign in our hearts is that there's consequences to us and the people around us. And so we have to figure out a way to disengage from that. It's always interesting to me when I talk, talk with people about sin because there's a lot of confusion, I think, about sin uh, in our society. And a lot of that um, has to do with this idea that it's almost, like, it's almost like you can't even talk about sin anymore without it being offensive to somebody. And part of that is because of the way some people have wielded the topic of sin as a weapon against other people or, or have made people feel less than or dehumanized people because of, because of this topic of sin. But sin is actually something that's one of the most loving topics we can talk about. Because connected to the idea of sin is the idea of God's grace. And so it shouldn't be something that we're afraid to talk about, right? We should, we should be willing to talk about sin and be able to talk about what that is and how it manifests itself in us uh, because of all the confusion that is around in our, in our culture and in our society about what sin is. But when I talk with people about sin, there, there's two really common responses, especially from people who are experiencing the consequence of their sins, right? They've been sinning long enough and the, and the sin has taken control and sin is, is rooted deep in their, in their heart, and so they continue to participate in it, and they start to experience some consequences of that. Then they have these responses, and there's two responses that I think are the most common, at least that I have encountered in my conversations with people. And the first one is this. This is the first reaction that people have when they're experiencing the consequence of their sin. The first one is, why is God doing this to me? Think about that. You have sin in your life. You know there's consequences of the sin that, that you've decided to participate in, and then somehow it's God's fault that you're experiencing these consequences. I was talking to, to a guy uh, a few weeks ago, um, and he was telling me about these financial issues he was having, right? And he's like, I've just been praying that I could get out of these, these financial problems. I, I don't have enough money. You know, I want to give to the church and I want to do this and I want to do this. And I just feel like I'm scraping by and why is God doing this to me? You know, I should be in a different place financially. And so we got to talking about his finances a little bit. And he, and he told me about the $500 date that he took his wife on, you know, that was full of, of dinner and drinks and everything else. And, and then he told me about, you know, when he was at Atlantic City and, and what he was playing poker and, you know, he was, he was gambling. And then he told me about, I mean, he told me about this and told me about that and all these things he was spending his money on that, that maybe he shouldn't have been spending his money on if he's in financial issues. But he talked about even these, these things that, that he was engaged in almost sinfully and then wondered why he didn't have enough money to get out of this financial cycle. You know, it's like, it like he made these decisions, but somehow it's God's fault as though God is some kind of bully that needlessly makes our life harder than it needs to be when it's actually our own decision-making that put us where we're at. Why is God doing this to me? The second response that I've noticed people have is almost the exact opposite. It's, the, it's this idea that, okay, I am so entrenched in sin that I, like there's this line that I have somehow surpassed. I'm so sinful, I've surpassed this line that there's no way God can love me now. Right? It's like the exact opposite where like God doesn't love me enough. That's why I'm experiencing these consequences. And now it's, you know, the major consequence that I have, I've just resigned to, to, to live this way now. God can't love me anyway, so I might as well just keep on sinning. And, you, and we've, talk, we've heard people say, I've heard people say this when I've invited them in church and they're like, oh, pastor, I can't go to church because if I walked into a church, lightning would strike me dead. Have you heard somebody say something like that? I have. You know, I've been going to church for a little while now. I've never once seen that happen. <laughs> I've never once seen lightning come out of the ceiling of church and strike somebody dead because they're too sinful to be in this building doesn't even make sense. But, but as somebody who believes that they're, they're so sinful, right? It's almost like they have this self-loathing of themselves. They don't love themselves. So if they don't love themselves, how could God possibly love them? It's not even scriptural. And here's what scripture says about that. Paul says it really clearly in Romans. We, we recite the scripture all the time. 
Paul says there is literally nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Right? There's literally nothing. Heaven or hell, demons or angels, not Satan, not even you can separate yourself from the love of God. God loves you. Like you can't, you can't out sin God's love. You can't reach a point where God just says, well, I'm done with him. It's not biblical. So I kept on playing basketball. And it was just a matter of minutes after I finished playing basketball that my muscles tightened up so bad, my muscles in my back spasmed so bad that I couldn't walk. I couldn't turn. I couldn't turn my head. I couldn't even breathe without my muscles spasming and I just would see up and I was just locked up in bed for like three days in so much pain. And my wife said those three words that every man loves to hear when they're in this much pain. I told you. I had a verbal warning and I had a physical warning. We read the story of Jeroboam. He had, a, he had a verbal warning and he had a physical warning with his arm. And this is what happens. In verse 6, the story continues. It says, Then the king said to the man of God, Intercede with the Lord our God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God interceded with the Lord and the king's hand was restored and became as it was before. The king said to the man of God, come home with me for a meal and I will give you a gift. But the man of God answered the king, even if you were to give me half of your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water or return by the way you came. So he took another road home and did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. Even after this, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, but once more appointed priests for the high places and from all sorts of people. Anyone who wanted to become a priest, he consecrated for the high places. This was the sin of the house of Jeroboam that led to its downfall and to its destruction from the face of the earth. Now, I want to say this. If you've not read this chapter, I, I've only just selected a small portion of it, but this chapter gets crazy and weird, and you should read it. It's a great read. Go and read the chapter. It can only enrich your understanding of the Lord when you read Scripture, so you should do that. But here's what happens is, is, is he gets this verbal warning. He gets this physical warning. He doesn't listen to the warnings, right? And so you get what happens there in the last part of that chapter. He continues on doing what he's doing, and Eventually, it leads to his destruction. He didn't listen. He didn't repent. He didn't turn. Now, we know that he believes in God because what happens when his hand shrivels? He tells the man of God, intercede for me that my hand would be restored. And so you have this beautiful symbol of what's happening. You have this beautiful symbol of, of Jeroboam's life. Right, And so if the withered hand is a symbol of what's going to happen to Jeroboam, if he continues on the path that he's on, then the restoration of his hand is a symbol of what God wants to do for Jeroboam. What could happen for Jeroboam if he turns to God? But Jeroboam is so focused on his arm. He's so focused on his hand that he almost has these blinders up of everything else that's going on around this whole situation. And the only thing he asks prayer for in that moment is for his arm. He doesn't recognize anything else that's happening. He doesn't recognize what the, the, the broken altar means, even though the man of God has explained it. He doesn't recognize all that God wants to do. He recognizes that God has this incredible power and he only asks for grace for his arm. I think it's easy for us sometimes when we pray, and, we, and we've been in this series of healing for the last several weeks, and, and in that we've talked about uh, asking for prayer for healing for our, our physical well-being, for our relational uh, things, relational brokenness, mental brokenness, spiritual brokenness. We, we've asked for healing for, for all of all of these things. 
But I do think it's sometimes easy for us to get super focused on the immediate. What am I dealing with right now that I need help with? And sometimes we can get so focused on the immediate that we forget about the eternal. We forget about what God wants so much more for us. It greatly supersedes my withered arm. It greatly supersedes my, my physical health, my finances, my kids, my marital issues, my mental health, my, my politics. That what God desires for me is more than just what is burdening me right now to be free from that, but it's to heal the brokenness in my entire life. Now, these are all things that we pray for. These are things we should pray for, but they shouldn't be the end-all, be-all of our prayers. Because if we're not careful, they can dominate our minds. They become a session to us. It could be like a paper cut that receives all of our attention. And this is Jeroboam's problem, right? His appeal to the prophet falls far short of what God wants to do in his life. His arm is healed, but ultimately what God wants to do is, is help Jeroboam find healing in his whole life. This is Jeroboam's lifeline. This is his chance. This is his opportunity to recognize, I mean, he is confronted with this power of God. He's confronted with a verbal warning, a physical warning, and a powerful display of healing. And his prayer is just, just heal my arm when it should have been heal my life. And so I wonder how often our prayers stop short. God could just help me win the lottery. All my problems will be solved. Have you ever prayed this prayer? Lord, if you'll just get me out of this mess. Right, you're right in the consequences of your sin and you're like, yeah, if you'll just get me out of this mess, I'll never drink again. If you get me out of this mess, I'll never gamble again. If you get me out of this mess, I'll never argue with my wife again. But the mess that we're in and the deliverance from that is not all that God wants to do for you. Jeroboam's prayer should have been, heal not just my arm, but my whole life. It kind of reminds me of uh, something that happened right after the Last Supper. Jesus has this interaction with his disciples and he, he does something kind of um, unexpected for them. You know, after they, they eat the, the bread and they, they drink the cup, Jesus looks around and he notices that his disciples' feet are dirty. You know, they didn't have shoes like we have and they walked around the desert in sandals, so they needed their feet cleaned. And, uh, and so he goes and he gets his basin and he puts some water in it and he gets down on his knees and he begins washing his disciples' feet. And watch what happens. We'll read it out of the book of John. It says, after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that's wrapped around his waist. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. You see, what Jesus is, is teaching Peter is kind of similar to what God is trying to teach Jeroboam. You, you can't receive something and reject it at the same time. So what Jesus is trying to show his disciples is, is just how great his love for them is. And he does this in, this in this weird symbol of washing their feet. But when he gets to Peter, Peter says, no, 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 no. It should be me washing your feet. You're the master. You're the teacher. I'm the student. I should be washing your feet. And Jesus says, Peter, unless you allow me to do this, you're rejecting me. And so Peter does the exact opposite of what Jeroboam does. Peter says, okay, Jesus, then not just my feet, my whole body. 
what Jesus is, 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 is displaying for them goes far beyond 30 feet. But what he's displaying for them in this, in this kind of intimate moment is how much love he has for their whole life. And we recognize that, that sin is not just something that happens one moment. It's not just an action. It's not just a decision that I make. But sin is brokenness of humanity. It's brokenness that's inside of me. Right? And so I can, I can pray for relief of my immediate situation, but, but sin is a life problem. And so when we ask Jesus for forgiveness, or when we ask God to heal a part of our life, we should also be asking God to heal our whole life. Because all of our burdens, all of our burdens, physical, relational, financial, mental, emotional, spiritual, all of our burdens are direct result of sin. Every single one. And so we ask God, not just this, but my whole life. I think about it like this. You can't receive something you reject, right? I can offer you an ice cream cone and you have several options. Now, ice cream, I heard somebody say after I got here this morning that ice cream tastes the best in the middle of the night. I disagree. I think ice cream tastes the best 24 hours a day. And I can offer you an ice cream cone and you can look at me and say that ice cream cone doesn't exist. You can recognize that the ice cream cone exists but refuse to eat it. You can be angry at the ice cream cone because one time you ate ice cream and you got a brain freeze. The only way you can taste it is if you receive it. That's it. That's the only way you can taste it. So you can't receive God's love if you reject God's love. Right? This is what Jeroboam does. That doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that his love is constantly displayed in your life. It absolutely is. His love is displayed in warnings. His love is displayed in answered prayer. His love is displayed in the people around you. But the only way to receive the healing grace of Jesus Christ that is constantly displayed in your life is to accept it. And once we recognize how Jesus wants to work in us, we can realize the power of that prayer. Lord, heal not just fill in the blank, but my whole life as well. And when you pray that prayer, you experience so much more of what Jesus has for you than just the healing of the immediate. You begin to realize all the places around you that he's already at work and the guidance he has for you for your whole life, the healing he has for you for your whole life, and not just what's right in front of me right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that great promise, Lord. And Lord, I pray that uh, that you'd help us to recognize that your desire for us is so much bigger than what we are experiencing in our life right now. But that your desire for us is eternal. Your desire for us encapsulates the entirety of our life. And so as we recognize, Lord, that, that the situations that we find ourselves in, the scenarios that we find ourselves in, as we recognize, Lord, that, that, that the things we need healing for are a result of this sin that is in our lives. Father, I, help that you would, I pray that you would help us to, to broaden our, our, our concept of the way sin and brokenness works all throughout our lives. 
And so, Lord, I just pray that if there's anyone here this morning, God, that needs to take that step to say, Lord, I need healing for my whole life. Yeah, I need healing in, 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 my, in my marriage. I need healing in my relationships. I need healing in my body. I need healing in all these different areas. But, but more importantly than that, I need healing in my life. Lord, that they would open their hearts and their mind for all that you have for them today. And experience it a life of healing that ultimately ends in stepping into eternity with you. So we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for that promise and that grace and that love that you have for us. And we give you praise. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it and that you got a lot out of it. If you feel like you need to respond, you can visit fairviewvillagechurch.com slash prayer and you can fill out the forms there and let us know how we can be praying for you. Or you can scan the QR code below and that'll take you everywhere you need to go for next steps. Thanks so much for joining. We hope you have a great week and looking forward to connect with you.